That was beautiful. All right, I'm going to take this into halftime. It's going to be me. Um, so here's a bit of trivia for you. I'm a movie fan, and I like scary movies, some of them. And I like Psycho, and so I went Googling, and I found out, do you know Norman Bates' mother has a name? Did you know that? And her name is Norma. She named him after herself. So she was really, he was really dead. Mama's, mama's, mama's boy. Okay, so here we go. It's Thanksgiving of 2001. Jonah is three weeks old. I have nursed him and given him a bottle of both and tucked him into his bassinet. And I'm getting ready to ask my husband Andrew something important. And I turn over my shoulder and I call his name and I say, Andrew, having this baby, this pregnancy, this baby, it's very different from when we had Emily four years before. I got pregnant with Emily when we still lived in New York on the Upper East Side. I, um, I approached that pregnancy as I did everything at that time in my life. It was a project and a problem to be solved, <laughs> right? Yeah. And, uh, and I was gonna tackle this. I was ready. I read books. I had a whole stack next to my bed. My favorite was called Your Pregnancy Week by Week. And I would read it to Andrew every Wednesday night and be like, tonight the baby is a plum. Tonight the baby is a peach. Tonight the baby is a cantaloupe. And she was resting on my bladder. <laughs> I was pregnant at the same time as my best friend Shelly, which was awesome. It was really fun. It was such a great time in my life. But it also meant that I had this need not only just to do this becoming a grown-up lady thing well, but I had to be the best at it. I had to be the most perfectest that I could possibly be. But I had an advantage in this competition that Shelly didn't know we were engaged in. <laughs> I, she was three months pregnant. She was three months ahead of me. So I got to know everything she was doing before I made my own decisions. Shelly was planning a natural pregnancy, a natural birth. So I planned a natural birth too, no drugs for me. And Shelly was going to be breastfeeding her baby exclusively. So I was too. Because also the books, my stack of books, said that was best for the baby. The only thing I didn't do that Shelly did was Shelly's pediatrician was gonna be on the west side and I lived on the east side. And if you know anything about New York, you know the west side may as well be California. <laughs> and I was not going there. But I did schlep Andrew to appointment after appointment for nine months. We went to the obstetrician together to talk about our birth plan. And we went to the furniture store to pick out the cribs. And we went on pediatrician interviews. So this might not be a thing everywhere, but in the 90s on the Upper East Side, this was a thing. Parents, soon to be parents, went to meet with prospective baby doctors to talk to them about like, their approach to vaccinations and to breastfeeding and all this. And we end up hiring this kindly old nearing retirement age European gentleman. And I have reservations, but what he really has going for him is he's on the corner and I can just walk there. <laughs> so my plans are in place and I feel really good about this because God knows I love a plan. It makes me feel like I am so in control of everything. And I have a plan and I'm in control, but it did not go that way. We have Emily four hours after my first contraction, 10 minutes after I get to the hospital. And it turns out that this whole natural childbirth thing means that we are going to be discharged within 12 hours of having this baby. So, so Andrew and I go home with a new baby and some pamphlets about being a good parent. And thank God my mother flies in from Florida because it, seemingly she knows more about the baby stuff than I do at least, so that's good. But 
though she doesn't know anything about breastfeeding, because that was not like a thing when she had me. People didn't really do that. So we're looking at the pamphlets and we're trying, it seems like it should work, you guys. I mean, <laughs> look at me. I have taken these with me everywhere I've gone since I'm 14 years old, right? And it seems like you just take the boob and you take the baby and you are breastfeeding. But there is more to it than this. There's like this latching stuff and supply stuff and it's terrible. So we go to the kindly European man on the corner and he looks at Emily and he tells us that she is failing to thrive. Yeah, so we do what anybody would do in that situation. I fire him. <laughs> and we hire Shelly's pediatrician on the west side. And we also hire this woman. So we're New Yorkers. I'm a New Yorker, right? I believe there is no problem I can't solve, especially if I can throw money at it. And I hire this woman, this lactation consultant. And she comes in with a three-step plan to increase my milk supply, okay? Step number one, I have to take these herbs that make me smell like maple syrup. <laughs> Step number two, I have to drink two gallons of water every day. Now, this is like, this is the worst, you guys. I'm like a camel. I do not experience thirst the way other people do. You give me like a, a cup of coffee and a Diet Coke and I'm good all day. But not that caffeine, so I can't have coffee and I can't have Diet Coke. And my mother is standing over me every 15 minutes with a glass of water and tapping her foot while I suck it down. And step number three, okay, step number three, is the rented breast pump. Every, we have to trick my tits into thinking I have twins. And every two hours, my mother hooks me up to a farm implement. And this thing goes like And we watch the milk dribble into the bottles. And I am presented with tangible evidence of my own inadequacy and my own failure. And throughout all of this, Emily's crying a lot. And I'm like, what the hell? Do all the babies do this? Why is she so difficult? My mother goes back to Florida, and Andrew goes back to work, and I'm left alone with this baby. And I'm supposed to be nursing her and giving her formula. And I joined the parenting support group at the 92nd Street Y, and I joined the nursing support group at Mount Sinai, and I joined this <laughs> gang of Upper East Side mothers having daytime weekday brunches with these gigantic strollers. And I start lying to my husband. And slowly but surely, I start peeling back the formula to breastfeeding ratio because I am aiming for the gold standard, this exclusive breastfeeding. Emily keeps freaking crying, man. That kid will not stop crying. I think maybe she has colic. And one of my books says that um, I have to cut out all the gassy vegetables in my diet because maybe I'm giving her gas, like that's the problem. So I do that and she keeps crying. And finally we go to the west side to Dr. Kana's office and I watch in horror as Dr. Kana puts the baby on the scale and starts moving the weight in the wrong direction. And Emily has not just not gained weight, she has lost weight. And the doctor says to me, enough. You breastfeed if you want to breastfeed, but you will give this baby formula and you will give her as much as she can drink. And if she drains the bottle, at the next feeding, you will give her more. And I start doing this and, you know, I only stopped crying quite so much. <laughs> and eventually one night, I forget to nurse her. Seriously, I actually forget. And she doesn't care. And the next day she's weaned and that's the end of us, me and Emily, in breastfeeding. It takes us three years to get ready to get pregnant again after all this. And in that time, we moved to Hartford, and 
I get pregnant again with, and, and Jonah comes. This whole pregnancy is really different because like I've got Emily to take care of. I don't read the books. I just sort of go, we, we're going to have midwives, but this time they're going to be drugs for sure. <laughs> and I, go, I, I go to the midwives and they check me out and I have Jonah and he's born. He's a little jaundiced, so we have to stay in the hospital for three days and I kind of hang out like I'm in a crappy motel all by myself. It's pretty awesome. I read a book. I eat some open pan. We come home. I call the neighbor down the street and I ask her for the pediatrician's phone number and I call to let them know that we will be coming. No interview required. And it's really different. And I don't understand like nature, nurture, is it Emily and Jonah? Or is it me? Like, have I finally kind of learned something, gotten it through my thick skull, that no one decision that we make for our children is the be all and end all. It's about making a lifetime of choices that bring them closer to us and us closer to them and bring them up right in this world. So that night, I tuck Jonah into the crib, into the little bassinet, and I turn over my shoulder and I say, Andrew, now my husband, you should know, says that I have as many ways of saying his name as the Eskimos ostensibly have words for snow. And he knows what each of them means before I continue. And I look over my shoulder and I say, Andrew, and he says, no. <laughs> and I say, what? You don't know. He says, I know. He says, no more babies. That factory is closed. <laughs> and that was the sum total of our family planning. <laughs> the next day, Andrew goes to the post office and he buys a sheet of stamps for the baby announcements. They have the Looney Tunes characters on them and Porky Pig saying, the, 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 that's all, folks. <laughs> and that afternoon, we stick them on the envelopes and we send out the baby announcements and we're done because with Jonah, our family is complete. Thank you.